Hello everyone and welcome back to class as we continue on with our discussion and looking more into the lore of the world that is Final Fantasy XIV. Now we will be continuing our discussion with the city on the water, Limsa Lomensa. I hadn't planned on doing Limsa right off the bat, but since we do know the most of the lands in Eorzea, especially with Limsa, Udal, and Gridania, I thought that it was a good chance for us to really get it out of our system and then just get them out of the way in general before we move on to something we may not know as much about. Now, for this week, we're going to be looking more into the lore about the Maritime City, and next week we'll be looking more into the land surrounding the city, in this case, Lenotia, and all that reside within this territory. So I hope that everyone out there is looking forward to learning more about this haven for pirates, a city full of brigards, cutthroats, and curs. Limsa Lomensa. So we're going to just start off with some basic information and that Limsa is a traditional Thalassakri or a state that is mostly a power derives from the naval or supremacies on the seas. Now out of everyone in the alliance, Limsa easily commands the maritime forces at sea with its leader in the form of the Admiral. Now most of the continent of Eorzea lies on the continent of Ardenald, but right off the coast we have Vildebrand, which rises up from the seas of the Rotano River and beneath the worn and ancient cliffs on its south shore stands the maritime city of Limsa Lomensa. A beautiful and wondrous sight, the city perches upon the pillars of rock and reef that jut out from the bay, and the townsfolk pass between the long areas on these bridges and thrive right above the sea. Their flag is a crimson standard with a long boat representing a pirate ship, which harkens back to the founders of the city who were the Sea Wolf Buccaneers, once known as the Terrors of the Northern Seas, and the red represents the spilled blood of lost companions, and reflects the city-state's savage and rather gruesome history, with their motto, Till Sea Swallows All. Now as for their government, the Lomensans choose their leader in the Trident, a competition held once every seven years. The strongest of the pirate crews run this multi-pronged race and whoever crosses the finish line first becomes the Admiral, the head of the Maritime city-states. Afforded sweeping powers over Limsa Lomensa, new Admirals will often drastically alter existing policies and with it change the course of the city-states. The current leader is Admiral Merweb Blofuswind. And though she is technically in charge of the entire city, she has a number of counselors nominated personally by her who oversee the everyday proceedings of the city itself. Now, the city itself is separated into two different types of decks. We have the upper decks and the lower decks. On the lower decks, we have the bulwarks. It's an enclosure located by the gate leading to middle Lanosia, and there's a lift that can transport adventurers to the drowning wench or the airship docks. It's a more secure lift which also provides access to the Admiral's office in the command room. We also have the Aukient, which is the open square in which the city-state's etherite crystal is located and where players can start off in Limsa begin. It's also perhaps the most busiest of the three city-states because we have the whole marketplace just right outside the ether right so it's very easy to get to as for the markets themselves we have hawker's alley it's the main commercial hub of limsa lomensa including several non-pc merchants that have just the assorted basics so it's a really good place to start off if you're just starting your whole adventure here in limsa in addition the market boards and retainer summoning bells are also available for players here and at the end here we have milvan's gate and this customs and access agency is for the city-state, which also functions as the Arcanist Guild under the acting guildmaster Fabreguem. 
Players who wish to use that class will want to visit here, and in case you're not aware of what the Arcanist is, uh, it's those classes that have those grimoires or those codexes that allow you to summon your carbuncles to your side. And the interesting thing is about the Arcanist is that it's the only job that has kind of a branched evolution, so to speak. You can either choose to become a scholar, a summoner, or both if you like. Also, a bit of friendly information here, if you are still starting off and you do have to get back to Vesper Bay very quickly, which is located in Thanalan and where the Waken Sands is, this is a very quick and easy way to get to it. You could just head over to the ferry located at the west of the facility and just take the ship straight over to Vesper Bay in western Thanalan. It will save you a lot of time, believe me. The wharfs down here contain both the Fisherman's Guild as well as a ferry that can actually take you to certain ports in Lanosia. And we also have, it's not really a main part of the city, it's just kind of there for aesthetic purposes if you ask me. But we actually have this ship which is known as the Astralasidia. It's registered as a trade vessel hailing from the foreign waters. And this battle scarred warship is actually captained by the lord of the region's underworld, one Eye Hilfra. Which serves as the gathering place for brigards, cutthroats, and the purveyors of sundry overbreeds of villainy. It is here that the city states many pirate crews find their new recruits to join their ranks. So everything that we just listed here is pretty much everything on the lower decks, like basically the things that you need to really focus on or need to know about. Going up to the upper decks though, we have the Drowning Wench. Now this is a tavern and the Adventurer's Guild, which is run by Balduron. Players starting in Limsa will begin their journey from here. There's also the End and the Levy Quest services, which are also available as well as a lift that can transport players to the bulwark or the airship decks. We also have several other places or landmarks that are kind of notorious, like places that you really should focus on. Some are more important than others. Uh, like one of the places is known as the Seventh Sage. It's the importer carrying exotic goods, all privateered by the Kraken's arms at the expense of the Garlean vessels. Not really a place that you're going to be spending a lot of time with, but if you ever want to stop by and see the sky, you can always do so. We also have the Bismarck, which is an establishment or a restaurant, probably one of the finest restaurants in Eorzea, if not the finest restaurant in Eorzea. And it is also home to the Culinarians Guild under the guidance of Langsbeth. So if you do want to learn to become a culinarian, you come straight here. There's also the Coral Tower at the end, and this tower is on the northern end of the barracks, and it's a training facility for the Yellow Jackets, which are the city guard. This also operates as both the Marauders Guild and a gunnery range, though we don't really actually have much of a gunnery range here, but this is definitely the place to come to if you do want to learn how to use an axe. As well as a place where you kind of learn to accept the whole quest line for the scholars. We also have the Ath Castle here. It's a town square kind of located near the Tempest Gate which leads to Lower Lanosia. We also have the Delivery Moogle and the Link Shield Distributor also found here. Those are good to know just in case. Located off to the side here we have the Maelstrom Command and we'll talk more about the Maelstrom in a moment. But this is actually the headquarters for the Maelstrom. Players who are affiliated with that grand company can obtain tasks, goods, and create a free company here. On the other side of the city, we have both the Blacksmith and the Armorer's Guild. Now this company regroups the smithing guilds of Limsa Lominsa. We have the smiths of Limsa who were impressed by the cobalt smithing techniques and quickly adopted them to become the Armorer's Guild. And in order to prevent further spreading that would put them at a disadvantage with the other city-states, the company ensures that the techniques are kept inside the city while also controlling the spread of Lominsan products. Following the opening to the city to adventurers, the arts of blacksmithing and armoring can be studied here. So it's kind of like a joint guild hall. So the ones outside kind of focus more on armoring, those inside focus more on the whole blacksmithing there. So you can actually learn to make your own armor, tools, and weapons at this place. And one last place I kind of thought that was going to be fun to mention. We actually have the missing member over here. It's just funny to go here. This is a tavern run by the pirate captain Roswin and her sanguine sirens. And again, I will be mentioning more about her, the Kraken's arms, and the maelstrom in just a moment. Now, as one would kind of expect for the maritime city-state of Limsa Lominsa, uh, the Lominsans revere Lem Lane, watcher of the seas and goddess of the navigation. True believers make pilgrimages to the mark of the navigator before they set sail, and upon their safe return to port. The worship of Lim Lane has roots in a loose collection of local beliefs, however, and thus can't be really thought of as a formal religion. 
Indeed, the Navigator has no grand temples, no clergy to her name, uh, nothing that is actually like devout worship to Lim Lane, like at least compared to some of the other religions, like like in Ishgard where we have the people worshiping Halone and they have these grand temples and entire clergy devoted to her. But not so much in Limsa. I mean, aside from a statue once in a while, they don't really have like entire devotion like directly to Lim Lane. They respect her and they do offer thanks to like the sea's bounties and everything, but they don't actually go out of their way to worship her. Instead, each man kind of keeps to his own faith when at home and through prayer and humble ritual. Now, as for the guilds, we have several guilds here in Limsa, such as the Marauders Guild, the Arcanists, the Rogues, the Blacksmith, Armorers, Culinarians, and Fishermen Guilds. So out of all the city-states, I do think that this is the one that actually has the most. I could be wrong about that, but definitely, but definitely one of the most, if not the most, of all the city-states. Now, as for the industries that we have here in Limsa, was actually several that keep the whole city up and running. Now we have like the traditional fishing, of course we have a lot of fishing here because they're right above the water, it's probably very easy for them. Laments and anglers come together in numerous loose association of pullers and eck out their living by casting lines off the coastal cliffs and drawing out in the open seas. We also have shipbuilding, which can be crafted into great warships or fishing vessels, either or. The shipwrights of Limsa Lamensa have no equal within the realm, as they themselves will proudly proclaim to anyone who would listen. As for the metalwork, again, we talked a little bit about this. It's the art of steel bending involved alongside the shipbuilding industry and has profited much from Lomins in exchanges with the Cobalt, who are masters of metallurgy in their own right. As for shipping, there are considerable knowledge of shipbuilding and seafaring, and it's natural that as a shipping industry, they would flourish in the city-states. Many more are seen trading vessels that can be seen sailing in and out of the port each day. And we actually have quite a bit of farming going on here, like such as Summerford Farms, because most of Lanostia is covered by plains that is actually perfect for growing. The settlement's instigated has made great strides in providing an honest livelihood for those retired from freebooting, and grow mainly oranges, grapes, and wheat. So mostly a lot of fruits, a lot of wheat, and actually it is quite understandable that they would grow a lot of wheat, and especially with grapevines, is because um, Limsa is quite known for drinking. It's known for making ales and excellent wines because, well, most of the people who live here are pirates, or at least former pirates. And if they're not, then they at least know someone who is. Now, as for like the diet of the whole city itself, Lumensin cuisine actually makes use of the abundant fresh fish and shellfish that you can get right on the city right below you. And it's not just because of all the fish and shellfish that you can actually get just by going outside your door. It's actually because of the seafaring culture, it brings in foreign spices and recipes from all over the world, which makes it a very popular place and probably why the Bismarck is so successful. And likewise, Lomincin liquors are developed to keep on very long voyages and they are famous for that, particularly the ales and wines brewed from the local wheat and grape in the great quantity. And one other form of industry I suppose you can count is piracy. I mean, in present day, piracy is pretty much forbidden. Privateering, on the other hand, is permitted provided that the targets of the plunder be of Garland origin. So this is actually something that the Admiral came up. So she's trying to create a much safer, more stable city-state for everyone, despite the fact that she herself was also a pirate for a long time. Of course, some traditions, I guess you could call them, are harder to kill than others. So she did set this whole thing up because you can actually become a pirate by trade, basically. Like, you can have special permission from the Admiral to become a pirate, and you can continue to pillage and plunder and do whatever you want out on the open seas, given that the only people you target are the Garleans. So like with their warships, their battleships, like even with trading vessels, so long as there's a Garlean flag on that ship, the privateers are free to attack them and do whatever they want to them. Like, they are open to any kind of treasures that they get from it. And that does pretty good business every once in a while. I mean, especially since most of the time that they do pillage these ships, it's mostly full of, like, weapons and loot and stuff like that. Not really treasure, but mostly weapons which they can sell later on. Now, the city state was founded by men fleeing the rules of kings, and Lomincens continued to see laws as more as guidelines than actual rules that have to be followed. Whether pirate or fisherman, though, citizens generally feel less loyal to their own city state than to their immediate crew. 
This spirit of freedom ever drives Limsa forward, yet the self-same wild abandon may appear brutish in the eyes of other Eight Orzian nations, and you can't really blame them for that. Now as for the leader of Limsa Lomensa, we have Murreb Blofuswin, or simply known as the Admiral, which I don't blame you for, it took me forever to learn how to say her name. Now the Admiral is the only daughter of Blofus Blofuswin, former captain of the League of the Lost Bastards. Love the name, by the way. Murreb Blofuswin served as a member of the flagship crew until the day she learned that her father had consorted with the Sahagans. Betrayed and angered at this, she challenged her father to a single combat on a deserted island in accordance with pirate custom. In other words, she returned alone and assumed leadership with the Lost Bastards. <laughs> Not long after that, she sailed the high seas in the tradition of her people, the Sea Wolves, and discovered a safe route through the Indigo Deep, to the recently discovered western continent known as the New World. She is also known to have sunk an invincible fleet dispatched by the northern nations beyond the Blood Rhine Sea. And with all these accomplishments in her name, she entered the Trident and emerged the victor. She has stood at the helm of Limsa Lomensa as Admiral ever since. And though Mareb has spent most of her 42 years joyfully on the seas, she can scarcely afford to sail the waves now that she's the Admiral. Instead, she indulges in her second passion, which is fine wines. Now, as for her weapon of choice, she actually technically has two in the forms of twin pistols. Their names are Annihilator and Death Penalty. Once the property of the infamous pirate king, Mistbeard, these muskets are rarely parted from Merib's side. She is rumored to have pulled the shorter of the two out of her pocket and with it put paid to her father, hence its name, Death Penalty. Now, after she took over as Admiral, she was the one who created the Maelstrom. Having resolved to establish a grand company to stand against the Garlean Empire, Merib took Admiral Azazar as her example and proclaimed herself Chief Admiral of the Maelstrom in 1572. This move granted her the power to command all ships and laments in waters, private and merchant alike, and effectively created a comprehensive command by which she could yield Limsa's entire might. The name Maelstrom actually originates with an earlier grand company on Gildebrand, one established by the seafaring civilization of Nim on the eve of the Fifth Astral Era. In the days shortly before coming of the Six Umbral Calamity's Great Floods, the Nimian Royal Marines converted the Grand Company to save the lives of their citizens. Sailing vessels into the Bay of Nymph, which is now called Gladian Bay, the Marines traced a magic geomancy upon the water's surface. As towering waves came crashing upon the city, they summoned an even mightier whirlpool to swallow the sea's wrath. Through time bought with the lives of many soldiers and scholars, this strategy gave the townsfolk time to escape to the mountains. However, the force of the whirlpool and the smaller waves swept away the civilization's capital. So in other words, the entire city of Nymph was wiped out trying to save its own people. The survivors of Nymph abandoned Vildebrand altogether and went to seek their fortunes elsewhere. Of course, that was the maelstrom in the good old days. The maelstrom that we all know and love right now, it oversees two armadas. We have the Crimson Fleet and the Privateers. The former is the maelstrom's main force and is comprised of five of the Lomensen Armada's original nine squadrons. While the formal Lomensen Navy and the Knights of the Barracuda initially preserved their separate command structure, it was completely integrated into the maelstrom following the seventh Umbral Calamity. The Yellow Jackets, once infantry of the Barracuda, have since been granted independence so that they may keep the peace throughout the Lomensen territory. The Privateer Fleet, on the other hand, is an auxiliary force, and it includes pirate vessels that answer the Admiral's call, armed merchant ships that have been relinquished, and retired warships that have been refit for service. The Foreign Levy is the final component of this fleet, an incalculable large contingent of adventurers whose experience in fighting on dry land makes up for Limsa's historical lack thereof. Now if you want to know exactly how their government is actually structured, this is a quick chart here. So we have the Admiral at top, so she's the head honcho, which is in this case Mered Blofitzwin. And out of the three, I have to say she's probably my favorite, I just love her attitude. Now, she's constantly has a kind of love-hate relationship with the other pirates of Limsa Lumensa. You either respect her and you get along with her merely for the sake of getting along, or you just hate her and you have to do everything in your power to kind of stand against her. Either way, it doesn't look like it's going to end well for you. After that, we have the Maelstrom Command. 
and we also have the Yellow Jackets who are, I mean, they're still officiated with the Maelstrom, but they're kind of more like a private peacekeeping corps. Like, they're the ones in charge of going around and just kind of doing what they can to protect everything on land. So we have the Maelstrom, the ones in red, out at sea, kind of protecting the city from all outside forces, and the Yellow Jackets are mainly the ones who are kind of on shore and they protect everything on land for the most part. I think the only exception to that is against the Kobolds. I do know that the Maelstrom also deals with them as well. And the Maelstrom is actually separated into two parts as we see here. We have the Crimson Fleet on one side and we have the Privateers on the other. And depending on what color sails that you have will actually determine like where the Privateers you are in that. Now as for the Yellow Jackets, they are under the command of Rainier Hensfield. And the organization is a pretty easy structure. Now we have the first levy, which is the one, the main force. They're the ones who guard Limsa which is the capital, so that makes sense. As for the other levies, their job is to kind of patrol and protect the neighboring villages and towns like scattered throughout Lenotia. Though the Yellow Jackets served to keep the peace in Lamensan territory and defend her coast, they began as a branch of the Knights of the Barracuda. They became independent after the Calamity, at which point they were assigned their new duties as part of the Maelstrom. Originally, little more than an infantry, the Yellow Jackets take their name from the popular bright yellow overcoats that all the members must don in line of duty. The name was officially adopted when the force split with the Knights of the Barracuda. So, aside from that and the Maelstrom, we do look more into the privateers, and so they have three great pirate powers that are kind of... They kind of keep the privateers all in line. They're like the main three forces that you kind of have to respect because they're not part of the Maelstrom. I mean, they are, but not really. They kind of just do their own thing. So at the very top of these three great pirate powers, we have the Bloody Executioners. Now, they are led by Hilafren. He's the master of the consorts and kind of the lord of the region's underworld. The executioners resisted Merebs when she first outlawed piracy, even going as so far as to unite rebellious crews to overthrow the Admiral. But due to the threats posed by the Garlean Empire and the Calamity, however, the pirates ultimately signed her Gladian Accord, which is getting permission to become privateers. In recent years, the Executioners remain a powerful presence, having secured a privateering license from the Admiral to raid Garlean vessels. However, Hilafren himself has kind of stepped to the side due to his age, and, and there has been talk here and there about other pirates scuffling in the back alleys trying to figure out who's going to succeed him. Now, the second great pirate force is known as the Kraken's Arms, who is under the command of Carvalen de Gorgonets. And there's a whole interesting story about the captain right there, but we can talk about that at another time. So, they actually command several large galleys that allow them to venture forth on long voyages with ease, not the least of which is known as the Misery, their flagship. They have traveled far to the east and raided the merchants and shipping vessels of the Garlean provinces from time to time. Calling these expeditions part of their spice trade, they have come to sell their exotic plunder at the Seventh Sage, and there reap the great profits. One may say, therefore, that the Krakens have taken to their new role as privateers better than any other pirate group. And the last of the three great pirate powers that we have are known as the Sanguine Sirens. Now, they're made up of an almost entirely female crew. The Sanguine Sirens were born of defiance. Some 30 years ago, four women sat out to make their fortune within a pirate society controlled by their male counterparts. These, the first Sirens, served aboard the another cruise vessel during the early years, earning a share of the plunder as sellswords during raids. Their numbers and wealth quickly grew, and in time, they acquired a ship of their own, the Lady Infernal. So when they rose to become the third of Limsa's great three pirate powers, they did so, like, completely on their own terms. And that's what I call girl power right there. At present, however, the crew is said to have languished under Rosalyn, who is the third captain of the Sirens. One explanation for this is that their tactics, the crew has made a name for themselves revealing the coastal waters and swift ships, as such, they may have suffered for a lack of prey sailing along the nearby seas. Alright, and so that's everything that we actually know about the government so far. We could actually go into a lot more talk about some of the gills, about some of the major citizens that we have, but that could take a whole other video, so we might do that again someday. We might revisit it. That. This here is just like the very basic 
story about Limsa Lomensa, its history, its role in it, like kind of the lore behind it. But we will be looking more into like some of the other guilds uh, sooner or later. I don't know when, but we'll be doing the lore of the whole world of Final Fantasy first. Now that we have covered pretty much the basic information about the city-state of Limsa Lomensa, I think it's time we actually look more into like the whole history of how the city came to be. So, for the founding of a city, in the year 874 of the Sixth Astral Era, the Gladian was set sail from the Isles Deep in the Northern Seas, and it was the last of a mighty armada which turned on its nation in the name of its people, only to meet defeat at the hands of those they meant to free. The Seawolf crew of this noble vessel, who could no longer abide the rules of tyrants, steered her crippled hull south through the unknown waters in search of a new home. After a year-long struggle cursed by many troubles along the way, the ship drifted to the southern coast of Vildebrand, and that's where it ran aground. The Gladian carried two Elizen helmsmen, known as Jean Del Navelle, a navigator, and the adventurer named Guy La Fagran. Now they were tasked with exploring the interior of the island. Now both confirmed that the region was very fertile, and in this land the crew realized that they had found their home that they had sought. Under Admiral Elizwen, leader of the expedition, the crew then built a small village inland of what they dubbed Lanosia, which was named after one of their crewmates who perished of scurvy just two days before they reached landfall. Man, that's gotta suck. However, it quickly became clear that the men and women of the Gladian were not alone. They had trespassed upon the domain of the Kobolds, a tribe of badger-like beastmen. After a few skirmishes, the crew abandoned their village for the relative safety of the Gladian, which they then had left stranded upon the Notian coast. From their ship, they were able to build bridges to the small islands and exposed reefs scattered about the bay, and the maritime city-state of Limsa Lamensa was born. So, it wasn't that they didn't want to live, like, on the land itself. The problem was is that they were vastly outnumbered by the kobolds, and so it wasn't safe for them, especially since they were probably still recovering from their long voyage. So rather than risk a fight that they knew that they were going to lose, they retreated to the galleon and instead they built up like all these bridges across like all these smaller islands, like all these cliffs and all these reefs, and that's why we have all those bridges scattered about. So it was pretty much safety for them. So they were like right above the water and I don't imagine kobolds are actually very good swimmers at this point. So the people were actually able to build like their entire lives like directly above the ocean. Now Lensa Lomensa, especially in its early days, was a place for coinless refugees. Since they were unable to make full use of Lenosia's rich resources due to the continued hostility of the kobolds, the Lomensans lived in poverty for the most part, much as they had in the northern seas. However, they were still sailors, they knew the seas better than anybody, and that eventually was what turned them into piracy. After occupying the few scant forests of Lower Lanosia and gaining a source of lumber, the Lomensans set about building warships. With the salt-heavy winds at their backs, the early townsfolk came into their elements and began to attack the merchant ships sailing the Rotano Sea. They were known as ferocious as wolves preying upon sheep. And as I'm sure you can imagine, pretty soon the city-state was rich with plunder and a black market had opened up to peddle the stolen goods. Thus, it was through piracy that Limsa Lomensa's population grew larger and more diverse. Plainsfolk Lalafell came from the South Sea Isles, drawn by rumors of cheap wares, and Lomensan pirates often gave members of captured crews the choice to join their ranks. Before long, sea wolves worked the docks of the maritime city-states alongside the Seekers of the Sun and the Hero. So exactly how they choose their leader is very interesting because they do need a leader to at least keep things somewhat from kind of crashing in on itself. And that's how they came up with the idea of the trident. Now as the number of pirates grew, they began to organize into proper crews. And as the number of crews multiplied, however, quarrels among them kind of became much more common so that it was pretty much dangerous just to step foot outside your house. Questions of territory and shares of plunder erupted into violence in the 948th year of the Sixth Astral Era. And again, even for nearly two decades after that, the streets were just running with blood of all these feuding pirate crews. And this whole madness continued until the year 963. That was the year of Agraharzo Rohesmarin, assumed the Admiralship. Admiral Agragasar invited the strongest of the warring crews to a negotiation table. Through bartering and no small amount of threats, he secured their solemn oath to put an end to all the fighting. 
and even more miraculously, he managed to put forth a code of conduct that every single crew had to follow. And apparently these rules kind of range, but there are three in particular that they all have to obey. No crew would cheat another of its plunder, nor rob a fellow Lamentson, nor sell fellow men into slavery. Through the code itself was revolutionary, its reinforcements was perhaps more so. The best of all the pirate crews came together and founded the Upright Thieves. Now they're a shadowy organization that punishes those who breaks the code. Now, Admiral Agragascar's rules became more as law to the pirates, not because they were imposed from above, but rather because they were reinforced in every back alley and bad tavern. Thanks to this, peace returned to Limsa. Now, Anagasar went on to tax to revive trade and plunder, and used the proceeds to boister the Knights of the Barracuda, the Luminson Navy. With this force, he devoted himself to fighting the Cobalts. Now, through Anagascar's reforms, Linsa of Luminsa became mighty. The pirates crews wealthy from raiding foreign vessels, while the Barracudas secured the interior territories and defended the harbor. In his later years, the Admiral also established the Trident as to avoid a war succession which was actually surprisingly successful. Truly, the maritime city-state would not be the power it is today without his many contributions. Now, for the next few several hundred years, the Trident reliably produced leaders who served seven years, though history is littered with admirals who stayed in the office for longer. Many pirate lords rose to the position and, through their strength, allowed them to reign in the rough seafaring citizens. In this way, Limsa Lominsa maintained unity as a city-state. Now, through the golden age of piracy, the Nonsuch, a pirate ship, was assaulted by the Sahagat of the Indigo Deep in 1049, and the following decade saw tensions with the aquatic beastmen rise. Reports of widespread attacks on Lomensen vessels, merchants, and pirates alike became commonplace. The beastmen later allied themselves with the Sea Spray pirates, jointly engaged in piracy during this time as well. At home, Lims and Lomensa continued to expand, as in the year 1062, Admiral Melvin appointed a plainsfolk arcanist from the South Sea Isles named Ikuku Iku as his advisor in matters of governance. Now, at her suggestion, he established the Melvens Gate to inspect and tax maritime traffic. In 1104, the harbor town of Aleport was founded in western Lenotia as a way to kind of prevent large vessels from clogging the ports of Limsa Lomensa. By the 1130s, the cedarwood in Lower Lenotia went barren from excessive logging. And this was what commenced the reclamation of Upper Lanosia to address increasing demands for lumber. The next decade saw hostilities with the Cobalts flare anew as consequence. In 1148, the Knights of the Barracuda launched a wide-scale offensive against the Cobalts to secure the woods of Oakwood. And it was after this great conquest was what created Camp Iron Lake on the shores of Iron Lake. In the turn of the 13th century, this saw piracy enter its golden age, with raids by Lomensen connoisseurs on merchant ships laden with udon riches becoming the order of the day. It was amidst this boon that in piracy that in 1221, the pirate king Misbeard appeared to terrorize the five seas aboard the flagship the Yar. He and his crew plundered the seas with impunity until 1249 when he was rumored to have perished in battle against an armed merchant vessel from Razet Hunt. Now, the masked pirate appeared again in 1251 when he plundered a wealth of treasures from Anhanga's Agwasi. Time and time again, the dread pirate would be reported dead, only to resurface, leading many to believe him immortal, when in fact the title was simply passed along from namesake to namesake. However, in 1496, Limsa Lomensa alongside Udal and Ishgard sent reinforcements to the city-states of Gridania to help them defend their homeland against Alamigo during the Autumn War. This loose alliance served as the predecessor for the modern-day incarnation of the Eorzean Alliance, of which Limsa Lomensa is still a part of to this day. In the year 1497, a Lomensan adventurer named Kitiram the Blue embarked upon a voyage across the Western Seas. After sailing the night for two moons straight, the sailor and his crew made landfall, rediscovering the continent far to the west of Aldenart, that so many people didn't even believe it existed at this time. Despite his attempts to name the continent Kitilan, the New World remains its more commonly used name to this day. Not only did Kitiram and his crew discover this landmass, they spent several moons exploring this inland. In 1499, they encountered the denizens of the sprawling nation of Majuja, and Kitiram was even granted audience with the Altarch, supreme leader of the Notori, to whom he presented various gifts from Eorzea. 
These rare gifts impressed their leader so much, he presented them a massive idol formed from pure silver, as well as allowance to roam free about his nation during their stay. Kiti Ram used the opportunity to map the land and gather roots, vegetables, and seeds to carry back home with him. And when he did return in the year 1500, word of his miraculous discovery spread across the city straight and more and more Limson set sail in search of glory and riches in the New World, which was what ushered in the Golden Age of Exploration. Most of these voyages, however, didn't end well because they were shipwrecked in the rough western seas or were ambushed by Sahagan as they crossed the Indigo Deep. In 1517, the city-state petitioned the Cobalt tribes for a peace accord in order to focus their strength on the campaign against the Sahagan and avoid fighting a war on two fronts. In the end of negotiations with the First Order Patriarch, both parties signed a pact of non-aggression, which bequeathed the man the bounties of the sea and the Cobalt's the bounties of the land. The ambiguity would later spark further conflict, but achieve the immediate goal of freeing the Lomensins to rage war on the Sahagan. Unfortunately for the Lomensins, the Battle of the Indigo Deep with the Sahagan did not end very well. It ended in complete failure with, by the Knights of the Barracuda and the Pyracruz that allied with them. However, the Trident was also to produce a leader in 1563 who would change the maritime city-state in greater ways than ever before, in this case, Mira Blofuswin. Though she herself was the pirate leader of the infamous League of the Lost Bastards, Mirab declared piracy illegal upon assuming admiralship. As such, that act shocks pretty much everybody in Limsa Lominsa and dealt a heavy blow to their economy. The reason that she did this? Well, she realized that Limsa could not face the encroaching threat of the Garlean Empire without powerful allies, and could ill afford to antagonize the other nations of Eorzea. Which was actually a smart idea, really, because she was smart enough to realize that they weren't going to have too many hands backing them up if the Garleans ever came knocking on their door. Now, naturally, the Admiral's order to outlaw piracy was very unpopular with a lot of people, and more than a few attempts were made on her life. However, her will was of steel and she refused to budge by even one ilm. She won the crews that she could through negotiation, persuading them of Limsa's need to cooperate with the other city-states, and the crews who remained unyielding, she kind of silenced, so she knows how to get things done. She showed her strength as a leader in other ways as well, particularly in defiantly dispelling the primal threat that came to hang over the city-states. In 1565, she allocated several state funds towards the hiring of the Company of Heroes, who was a famed mercenary band. And together, they not only put a stop to the Cobalt summon god, Titan, in that same year, they worked together alongside the Knights of the Barracuda to fell Leviathan when the Sahagan summoned him up. Seeing both the Lord of Crads and the Lord of the World defeated, through the Admiral's foresight, many Lomensins warmed up to Merib, and soon these forces that decried her were singing her praises. By 1572, she was able to establish the Maelstrom, Limsa's Grand Company, and her final victory was at the Gladian Accord, when which she bound the pirate crews to the Maelstrom, and unified all of Limsa Lomensa under her command. So, Limsa Lomensa, in a lot of ways, is a city-state that shows that even when you come from nothing, like, even if your background may not be, like, the very best, like, I know a lot of people would consider it to be bad blood, this shows that with a steely will, like, someone who is not afraid of anything, who is determined to go after what they want, can make their way in this city. It's not easy, but this whole city is about freedom. I mean, sure, you do need some set rules to keep everything from going chaotic, but basically, this whole city was founded on the needs for freedom, to be free from tyranny, to live their own lives and do what they want without fear of being, like, judged for it or being attacked under a tyrant's fist. Now, during the Seventh Umbral Era, this was during when the Project Meteor was given name by the Garlean Empire as a plan to call down the Lesser Moon of Dalamud and use it to smite Eorzea, opening its path to conquest. This was where the three city-states kind of joined forces with each other, and the Admiral was the one who represented Limsa Lominsa, of course. She was even there that day at Cartano. She fought alongside her allies and came to protect Louis Swa and the other adventurers as he worked a spell of summoning to push back the Lesser Moon. 
Of course, no one could have really anticipated that the moon would burst open, revealing the elder primal Bahamut, who would then rain down hell upon them all. Cardinal was ground zero for when Bahamut awoke. And when this happened, all Ling Shell communications went down for the Grand Companies. Merib rode headlong straight into the chaos astride her chocobo victory to personally issue the order to the three great pirate powers like the Kraken's Arms, the Sanguine Sirens, and the Bloody Executioners to fall back. Along the way, though, she was struck by a Magitech Reaper and lost consciousness before she was saved by the Bloody Executioners. Grandstorm Marshal Sasfearson, her second in command, gave the order for them all to fall back to Limsa Lomensa in her stead. In Limsa Lomensa right now, a massive tidal wave hit the coastline as Bahamut flames passed over the city and debris from Dalamut struck the land. In the aftermath, Vladian Bay was littered with bodies and floatsmen, and temporary command for the Maelstrom was established at the Morby Dry Docks, sheltered from the worst of the waves by the God's Grip while the remains of the Maelstrom sailed with food and supplies for the survivors. During the Seventh Umbral Era, Merib relocated Maelstrom Command to the upper decks and reformed the Maelstrom power structure. She disbanded the Knights of the Barracuda, fully integrating them into the Maelstrom save for the Yellow Jackets, who gained independence as the local peacekeeping force. Of course, not long after the Seventh Umbral Era, the Sahagans summoned the Primal Leviathan once more and used their god to unleash a tidal wave on the inhabited Halfstone region of, Lo of Western Lonosia. The Sahagans quickly moved in and established a spawning ground in the region to replace the ones that were destroyed in the Calamity. So yeah, that's kind of a back and forth between Limslomensa and the two Beastman tribes on either side of them, so it's just a lot of bad luck. Fortunately, Merub did survive and she did take full command of everything and eventually was able to help build the people back up to a situation of maybe not healed, more or less, but at least stabilized. Stabilized so that we don't have to worry about collapsing again. So, Limsa Lomensa is actually one of the three city-states that you can actually start off with, and for your services to the city, you are eventually recognized by Merub and invited to a banquet as her honored guest. Eventually, you're made of an envoy, and you're free to travel to the other city-states. And we do see Limsa Lominsa from time to time, such as when you return later on as part of the Scions of the Seventh Dawn to deal with the Primal Titan, and then much later on when you're called back to deal with the problem of Leviathan being summoned uh, once again. With the threat of the Ultima weapon imminent, though, Mirab and the other Alliance leaders briefly entertain the idea of surrendering to the demands of Gaius van Belsar. However, with the return of the Scions of the Seventh Dawn, it helped convince them to gain the will to fight against the Empire to the last. During Operation Archon, the Luminsen Armada blocked Castrum Marinum for, while the Maelstrom's forces seized Castrum Ossidens as part of the coordinated assault with the other Grand Companies. At a victory celebration in Mordona, following the Warrior of Light's defeat of the Ultima Weapon and Van Belsar, Merub and the other representatives of the other Grand Companies herald the beginning of the Seventh Astral Era. After all of that, we don't really see the Admiral again, like at least from time to time we do see her, especially when it comes up to the idea of fighting against the Garlead Empire. She was there during Operation Archon, she was there during the threat with Leviathan, and when she was introduced to Lady Ugiri, she did offer to send much-needed food and supplies to the other domains. She said that she did want to invite them to stay on Lomension shores, but as unstable as they still were, it wasn't a really good idea. But she did offer to send provisions, which they were very grateful for. And Yugiri ended up repaying that favor by kind of joining with the rogues guild. I mean, she didn't really join with them, but she was kind of introduced to them and she did share a lot of techniques with them, like techniques that she learned from the Far East. She was also there in Alamigo when she led forces of the Maelstrom to retake the city-state of Alamigo, fighting alongside Raubon and all the others. And she was also there during the whole battle at the Gimlet Dark, where she led her forces, again, against the Garlean Empire to stand with the other forces of the Grand Companies and the Eorzean Alliance to prevent the Garleans from taking one step further into Eorzea and retaking Alamigo. Now, Limsa Lumensa is a steady ally, especially to the Scions of the Seventh Dawn and to the Warrior of Light. 
The Admiral is always there willing to help out and she does have a soft side even if she doesn't like to show it once in a while. I've always really did like the Admiral. I always kind of saw her as like this strong, like immovable force of nature. Like she's like this solid rock standing against like the oncoming waves of the ocean and no matter how many times like the waves bat against her she is not moving she is standing her ground she is getting what she wants one way or another uh i mean this is one of the three city states that you start off with but this is especially important to me because this was where i started off this was where i began my journey as an adventurer and it was really my first introduction into the world of Final Fantasy XIV, which I love. I love all the war that has to do with Limsa Lomensa, and I'm happy with it. I just love this place. And I always get like that little thrill inside every time we have to go back to Limsa Lomensa, at least even if it's for a small quest or something, it's always nice to see it. Anyway, everyone, I think that's it for now. This was definitely a long video. I was planning on doing all of Lenoshia as well, but with how long that Limsa ended up becoming, I think that that may be a little bit too much information for right now, so I decided to separate the city-states and the surrounding lands into two separate videos. So, I hope that everyone enjoyed the video this week about Limsa Lomensa. I know I had a lot of fun making it. Next week, we're actually going to be going off into the lands of Lenoshia, so hopefully it won't be as long. But each land has their own unique history, their own unique lore, and the kind of people there that we can go ahead and meet, as well as the two beast tribes, which we will talk about as well. But yeah, otherwise, I hope you all enjoyed it, and you're going to be looking forward to next week when we delve into the history and lore of Lenosia. So until then, take care and have a good rest of your day.